Good morning, Greenspring. It is August, uh, Tuesday the 25th. Um, today we're continuing on our celebration of our Telly Awards, next on Village in Motion. Hello Greenspring, I am Margaret O'Mara, the Gubak Scholarship winner, um, and today we'll be showing you a award-winning tele uh, program from February 2008 about um, the Mr. Rogers Show. Enjoy. Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for look. Greetings, Green Spring. This is Helen Reynolds, and I'm your host for the February 27th issue of Village in Motion. And we have dedicated the program today to the famous Mr. Rogers, who conducted the children's television program, that very charming program. Uh, and this is an anniversary. And so we have two people today who are very closely, or were, closely associated with Mr. Rogers. And I guess first we'll have Dennis Jones, who is now our head of pastoral ministries. And you worked with Mr. Rogers in his early days, didn't you? That's right. I was very fortunate to work with him back in the late 60s in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He had uh, graduated from Rollins College in 1951 and then came to Pittsburgh went to the same seminary that I attended, although he was a little ahead of me. I think he was ordained about 1962, and he was starting to put together his ideas for what eventually became Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood when he and I met and worked together for a brief time. And so this was all in Pittsburgh at the time. That's right. Uh, but later on, you all got on national television. Well, uh, you have to take back the you all. He did. <laughs> I, I didn't. You didn't, uh, no. He chose one path and I chose another, but fortunately okay. our friendship spanned both of those paths yeah. and we were able to keep in touch. Oh, that's great. And uh, Betty, you were actually a neighbor of Fred Rogers. Well, no, it really started off because my brother and he went to Western Theological Seminary. I see. And so they met as classmates, both living in Pittsburgh, both having finished college. And my brother's major was child growth and development. So they had an interest, common interest, from the very start. And then they remained friends, very close friends. And mine was more meeting Fred probably 20, 30, a long time ago. Yeah. And he already was established in television That's at right. that time, you're saying. And we celebrated my brother's birthday together. He to our house. I've been to his house. And mutual friends. And he always carried in the plate with the cake. And his wife, Joanne, uh, always played the piano. We never went anywhere where there wasn't a piano. Mm. In fact, my brother has Fred's old piano downstairs. Mm -hmm. So that's how I met. So he was a musician as well as uh, a, a television personality. In a way, you say he Yes, was. Fred was. Yeah. Both he and his wife had grand pianos at the end of the living room. My goodness. Uh, I mean, it was a big living room. It must have been, yes. Uh huh. Well, Dennis, um, you say, uh, just when did you meet him exactly then? Well, it would have been in 60, 1967. Yeah. And I didn't have the same kind of relationship that Betty has. I think for me, Fred was always a, a tremendous inspiration. I was mm -hmm. just getting started in my pastoral career, and it was just my good fortune to bump up against such a man. She mentioned that he is a musician. He's many things, but I will always remember him as probably the 
oldest preschool child on record in the United States. <laughs> and that influence has continued. You watch his shows today. They're just as wonderful and just as warm as they were 40 years ago yeah. and in the 40 years since then. So for me, he's always been an inspiration and a mentor and someone who has given guidance and direction regardless of what field you go into. Yeah. And uh, I've discovered that people that uh, know him call him Fred, but people that know him really intimately call him Mr. Rogers, which is a tribute to his <laughs> That's character. Right. That's, right. <laughs> That's kind of a switch around, isn't it? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, well, you say he went to seminary with your brother, was yes. that right? Yeah. But my brother was not ordained, and uh. I've never asked him why. It was a degree I think he wanted. Then my brother went to the University of Pittsburgh and continued on. Yeah. And so you kept in touch with the Rogers family, did yes, you? Yes, yeah. we did. And, yeah. But they were just regular people. It wasn't, they were just like not friends. Not a big TV star type thing. That's right. Uh, <laughs> okay. But it's nice to know people who actually knew him, you know, because we all, I don't think I, uh, knew him so much as a TV personality because I was probably a little too old to watch the program when it aired, you yeah. know. And uh, so I didn't catch up to him till reruns, I suppose, when he had been retired. Well, I think even though Betty and I have many fond memories that relate to specific times and, and yeah. places, it's my feeling that if you ever watch the show and ever really paid close attention to Fred, then you probably know him as well as we do. Yeah. <laughs> because the man he was on television is the man that, that he was in real life. It's wonderful, I think, to be able to project yourself as you are, as you really are, uh, in such a sort of a false medium in a way as TV or showbiz or whatever you want to call it. Well, one of the things we discovered as we started working on this show and Diane having us was working with us and getting it started, we put a notice on Channel 6 about five or six weeks ago mm -hmm. asking if any of the residents here had anything they'd like to share about Fred Rogers. And we didn't hear anything. Hmm. And so I went to Diane and I said, let's change that and say, if you have anything to share about Mr. Rogers. And then we started hearing from folks here because <laughs> residents thought Fred Rogers must be one of the residents here that they just didn't know. <laughs> So it's Mr. Rogers. Yeah, he would have fitted in very well here. Oh, I he? think so. <laughs> would have been the life and soul of the play. But anyway, well, uh, it's really great to know people. Who, you know, I could touch people who touched him. So uh, uh, as we say, he would have fitted in so well here because he had this very easy personality where you didn't feel that he was acting at all. I, I, I agree. I think he would fit in to a point. Yeah. Uh, Fred's attraction was to children. Yes, that's and Not true. necessarily to adults. Now, yeah. friends that knew him knew him in a, in a social setting. Yeah. But Fred has gone places and spoken to adult groups, and they don't have the intelligence and the imagination and the foresight that little children do. And they quickly got bored with what he was saying. Oh, my goodness. And I often felt that if Fred could go into an adult group and get everybody to sit down on the floor, they would have been much better off. Ah, uh, but it's getting up off the floor. That well, be that's that. right. <laughs> and I always felt that if we can have people like Fred that can reach the children, we can yeah. find other people to talk to the adults. Well, that's a good idea. But too. I can see him in his red sweater and his tennis shoes and uh, carrying his neighborhood trolley down the halls here many, many times. I think he would have been dearly loved here. <laughs> I think he would have, too. Uh, well, we are going, I think, to have uh, a video today, but we have a couple of minutes before we have to. So was there any special message you wanted to give? Well, I heard you say people who were really close to Fred called him Mr. Rogers. It finally has dawned on me. My brother calls him. Mr. Rogers, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, they were so close. <laughs> but I just, I've never asked Jimmy why he called Fred. See, I didn't know him that well, so I called him Fred. It just seems funny. It seems kind of backward, doesn't it? Well, it does. But I felt like saying Mr. Rogers, and I thought, well, no, I'm going to be here. I will call him Fred. <laughs> <laughs> to his face, you did call him Fred, but when you're yeah. referring to him, it's Mr. Rogers. 
I think the uh, one of the clips that we're going to see is one that was made in 1969 when Fred came from Pittsburgh here to Washington to try and get some money for his public TV. Mm -hmm. And this picture that's right next to me here, mm. even though it's black and white, if it were in color, that would be the red sweater. Yeah. And Fred did not like to wear suits. Yeah. In fact, when you open the show, he always comes in and takes off his suit jacket, puts it in the closet, and puts on the sweater. And I've always liked him for that because I don't like to wear suits either. But <laughs> Channel 6 didn't provide me with a red sweater this morning. Oh, so, that's too bad. But if I'd that's only the way known. He yeah. <laughs> so when we see this clip, it's when he came here. He had to buy a suit to come here to Washington and appear before the Senate. Good heavens. And so we'll see that when it's on in, in whenever they're ready. His yeah. To that fact, we in public television are proud of Fred Rogers and I'm proud to present Mr. Rogers to you now. All right, Rogers, you got the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Pastore, this is a philosophical statement and would take about 10 minutes to read, so I'll not do that. Uh, one of the first things that a child learns in a healthy family is trust. And I trust what you have said that you will read this. It's very important to me. I care deeply about children. My first children... Will it make you happy if you read it? I'd just like to talk about it, if all it's right, all right. Sir. Okay. My first children's program was on WQED 15 years ago, and its budget was $30. Now, with the help of the Sears Roebuck Foundation and National Educational Television, as well as all of the affiliated stations. Each station pays to show our program. It's a unique kind of funding in educational television. With this help, now our program has a budget of $6,000. It may sound like quite a difference, but $6,000 pays for less than two minutes of cartoons. Two minutes of animated, what I sometimes say, bombardment. I'm very much concerned, as I know you are, about what's being delivered to our children in this country. And I've worked in the field of child development for six years now trying to understand the inner needs of children. We deal with such things as, as the inner drama of childhood. We don't have to bop somebody over the head to make him, to, to make drama on the screen. We deal with such things as getting a haircut or the feelings about brothers and sisters and the kind of anger that arises in simple family situations. And we speak to it constructively. How long a program is it? It's a I'm half hour every day. Most channels schedule it in the, in the noontime as well as in the evening. Uh, WETA here has scheduled it in the late afternoon. Could we get a copy of this so that we can see it? Maybe not today, but I'd like to see the program. I'd like very much for you I'd to like see. I'd like to see the program itself, or any one of them, you see. We, we made 100 programs for EEN, the Eastern Educational Network. And then when the money ran out, people in Boston and Pittsburgh and Chicago all came to the fore and said, we've got to have more of this neighborhood expression of care. And this is what, this is what I give. I give an expression of care every day to each child to help him realize that he is unique. I end the program by saying, you've made this day a special day by just your being you. There's no person in the whole world like you, and I like you just the way you are. And I feel that if we in public television can only make it clear that feelings are mentionable and manageable, we will have done a great service for mental health. Uh, I think that it's much more dramatic that two men could be working out their feelings of anger 
much more dramatic than showing something of gunfire. I'm constantly concerned about what our children are seeing. And for 15 years, I have tried in this country and Canada to present what I feel is a meaningful expression of care. Do you I've, narrate it? I'm the host, yes. And I do all the puppets, and I write all the music, and I write all the scripts. Well, I'm supposed to be a pretty tough guy, and this is the first time I've had goosebumps for the last two days. <laughs> well, I'm grateful, not only for your goosebumps, but for your interest in, in our kind of communication. Could I tell you the words of one of the songs which I feel is very important? Yes. This has to do with that good feeling of control, which I feel that the children need to know is there. And it starts out, what do you do with the mad that you feel? And that first line came straight from a child. I work with children do doing puppets in, in very personal communication with small groups. What do you do with the mad that you feel? When you feel so mad you could bite. When the whole wide world seems oh so wrong and nothing you do seems very right. What do you do? Do you punch a bag? Do you pound some clay or some dough? Do you round up friends for a game of tag or see how fast you go? It's great to be able to stop when you've planned a thing that's wrong and be able to do something else instead and think this song. I can stop when I want to, can stop when I wish, can stop, 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 any time. And what a good feeling to feel like this and know that the feeling is really mine. Know that there's something deep inside that helps us become what we can. For a girl can be someday a lady and a boy can be someday a man. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. <clears throat> Looks like you just earned the $20 million. <laughs> Back in the studio now, uh, we have, besides Dennis Jones, who stayed with us, we have Kathy Bonner, our Green Spring resident, about how she watched Fred's show even after her kids left home. <laughs> you want to tell us about that? Well, initially, I was a little hesitant to turn them on to Mr. Rogers. That, I thought he was a little fruity to begin with, you know, just too good to be true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the more I watched, the more I loved his uh, consistency, his calmness, and he would get out of his work clothes and into his play clothes. You know, that was a good thing because I had a hard time peeling them out of their school clothes to get into their play clothes, <laughs> things like that. And, and now today my 40 plus year old was all excited that we were doing a program on him because he remembers him very fondly. He remembers him well, huh? Very fond. And I feel like he was one of my neighbors too even though I didn't live in I Pittsburgh. Think that's, <laughs> yeah, that seems to be everybody's reaction. He's my neighbor as well as your neighbor, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So do, uh, do you have any like old uh, reruns or old uh, tapes of his that you can watch at home? Or? Just just in my head. It's I think. in your head. Yeah, and uh, just the trips that he would take the kids on where they made things like crayons and sneakers and things like that. And yeah. yeah. It's just well, as I post said, office. Yeah. Speedy delivery. <laughs> <laughs> as I say, I, I was a little, uh, little too old in one sense and a little too young in another, but I mean, uh, that it it's uh, nice to know somebody who really knew him, you know, yeah. and uh, that he was a live person and not a TV personality. Okay, we're now going to have um, a creative person, I think, is a video about Fred Rogers. And Fred's house will change a little bit. But the format and the furniture today are not much different from this first national program. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor, would you be mine? It was for this new national series that Fred asked Johnny Costa to be a musical director. It was an interesting choice because Costa had an unusually sophisticated musical style, especially for a children's program. His trio performed the music live 
in the studio as each program was videotaped. Like you, I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you, so let's make the most of this beautiful. You know, when I sat down to do the very first program, when Fred wrote the song, you know, and I had to have an intro, you know, and I had remembered that, uh, I don't know, somehow being in Oakland, and right near where I went to college at uh, Carnegie, and I had worked on a Beethoven uh, a sonata, and the trio went something like this. And so I thought, hey, that might make a nice intro for the program. So I did that. Instead of three-part harmony, I did it in fours, and did, uh, you know, that would be a nice intro for the song. And he, then he would sing, so that stayed. He is one of the most gifted musicians that I have ever met. He is probably one of the finest jazz pianists in the world. When I first started to work with Fred, I mean, I was real, and I mean, a real jazzer, you know. And, and I thought, well, I don't know, Joe's program. Well, I just wonder, can I play the things that I'm, I've been playing, that I want to play, you know? And uh, Fred didn't care. And so when I play uh, Good Feeling, you know, I didn't do it for the years of a child. I didn't do it this way. I wouldn't do that, so I figured, well. And Fred loved it, and, uh, and I, I kept doing it, and the people loved it. Well. With that kind of music, you couldn't help but find inside there an exceedingly sensitive man, which he is. A gifted, sensitive man. Want to play a little jazz? Just a chorus of it, okay? <laughs> Johnny Costle was just one of Fred's many creative collaborators who became loyal and long-lasting parts of the neighborhood. Fred gathered a sort of repertory troupe of actors and performers who appeared regularly on the show in both the realistic and the make-believe segments. Many of the cameramen and the technicians who worked on the show were part of the neighborhood for decades, too. They knew the program structure inside and out. And while they captured Fred and his world on videotape, they also had an ancient tradition of joking with Fred. All right. Okay. Are we having audio problems or something? What? What are we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Fred came to trust these people around him, the folks who helped him end every program with this song, while he changed his shoes and got ready to go out the door again. Wake up, ready to say, I think I'll make a snappy new day. It's such a good... <laughs> oh, is that mine? Who's are these? They're Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Now we're going to talk with Jean Reynolds, uh, one of our residents and a lady of many, many talents, who's going to tell us about how she came to compose music with Mr. Rogers for Jack and the Beanstalk. Is that correct now? You, yes, that's correct. You worked with him? Not with him. No, I worked with the Bob Brown puppets. Oh, I see. Who frequently appeared on his show. Oh, yeah. And they were playing at the Virginia Theater, doing a show there. And since I was being billed as the sweetheart of the Virginia Theater at the time, <laughs> and I was playing the pipe organ. Oh. I played before the shows, and I would play during intermission. Mm -hmm. And Bob and Judy Brown did their show there, which at that time was Hansel and Gretel. But they were preparing Jack and Beanstalk, mm. and they needed some sound effects. And when they heard me play the xylophone on the organ, mm. they asked me if I would do some sound effects for them. So they then came to our house. Um, my husband at the time, uh, Mr. Lotzenheiser, 
and I had a, installed a Wurlitzer pipe organ in our home. Oh. And so they came to our home with their taping equipment, and uh, I couldn't imagine what they got was going to do any good because they would just say things like, well, now we want to see Jack go up the beanstalk. So I would think a minute and then turn on the xylophone, da 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 and get him up. <laughs> and then when he came back down, of course, we had to go back up there and get him down, but he came yeah. down faster, so he can do 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 <laughs> And when the giant was walking, and I just put my whole hand on a whole bunch of keys and blomp, blomp. <laughs> So it wasn't really much music, but uh, and then they just took those bits and put them into what they wanted, where the uh, conversation to, was and everything. To fill in their beanstalk. Yes, and it was very stock. interesting, but I, I couldn't imagine how it would ever get used. And I never heard anything for the longest time. And then one day my daughter called. She was living away, and she mm -hmm. said, Mother, I just saw your name on the television. I said, oh, no. Yes, I did. She said it was on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And it said, music by Gene Lotzenheiser. Well, that's, you don't confuse that with anybody else's no, name. No, I was going to say, it's <laughs> not like Gene Brown. Or right. Anything. So it was very interesting. And I uh, built friendship with the Bob Brown puppets. Mm -hmm. And as you recall, perhaps they were here a year ago last Christmas mm -hmm. and did a puppet show here mm -hmm. at Greenspring for the residents and their little children. Mm -hmm. And last year was the Bob Brown Puppets 50th anniversary of doing oh. puppet shows. But I was able to see uh, this on Mr. Rogers two or three times after that in reruns. Uh -huh. So I felt like that was very special because I admired Mr. Rogers very much. Yeah. Uh, had you known him before this episode or not? No, and I never did meet him. Oh, I see. I never did meet him. I worked just with the Bob Brown puppets. I see. And then they took the show to, to him. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that was a very interesting experience anyway <laughs> and something to look back on. And I would think it would give you an added interest in Mr. Rogers. Yes. Uh, but you didn't actually ever really meet him, did no, you? No, I didn't. I did. No. But I'll tell you, so one thing, when I hear Dennis Jones speaking at times, I could close my eyes and think I'm listening to Mr. Rogers. Really? <laughs> you can play a, the part very that's well. That's quite a compliment. It, it must have rubbed off on you. Well, I think it's interesting at the same time that folks like Gene were doing music that were influenced by Fred Rogers, there was also uh, another show that was in its early stages called Sesame Street. Oh, yes. And if you course. remember the music there, it was loud and fast huh? and very different. And the Mr. Rogers music stayed the same as it was and really appealing to a couple of different audiences. Yeah. Uh, my daughters would watch Fred, and they made a commitment for an hour to sit down in front of the screen and watch yeah. and be a part of the whole show. A lot of the children that thoroughly enjoyed and watched Sesame Street, it was a series of sound bites and visual clips and so forth. and you really didn't make the same commitment. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to see that at that particular time, uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, that these two very different shows were kind of going down the same path yeah. to drastically change and improve children's television. Yeah. Uh, he certainly did make a big improvement on children's television, it's no doubt about I, that. I see him as the patron saint of children's television. Yeah, in this and country. I think that probably was one of his purposes was right. to improve children's television, don't you think? Yes. Yeah, rather than just a lot of cartoons and so on. No, I, th I think rather than entertaining, he was trying to find out where the children were and what they could bring to them, but what the children also brought to the TV. Yes, that's, that's a good concept, I think. Uh, I think we probably... Welcome back, Greenspring. That was an award-winning uh, program from February 2008 with our pastorals director, former pastoral director, Dennis Jones, and resident Jean Reynolds. Um, now we're moving on to announcements. Our special programming is the Steve Gubak Travelogue at 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. and Village Church at 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. Wednesday on Village in Motion, we will be continuing, on, continuing our tele-celebration. 
Our feature programming is August, August's Coffee with Ben at 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. and Green Spring Fellowship at 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. Now we have the brain tease for today. If you were running a race and you passed the person in second place, what place would you be in now? The answer will be tomorrow. Thank you, Greenspring, and I wish you a wonderful day in our Greenspring neighborhood. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor.